Hey everyone, this time we are going to be talking about Monsters in the Dark, the making of XCOM UFO Defense by David Craddock. This game means an awful lot to me, and when I heard about the book being made, I was so excited, especially since it was being written by David Craddock, who is a very, very good author. I've read a bunch of his books, I haven't posted all the reviews for them yet, but I just really love the way that he tells this story. I go on quite a few rants in this, so uh, I do want to apologize for that. I just really love this book, and I love the game, I just really love XCOM UFO Defense. This book tells the story of Julian Gallup and how he created the game XCOM. It also brought up a lot of really great memories for me. I just loved reading this book and it made me want to go back and play the original PC version of this game. I just remember with my friends, like we would all be huddled around like this old CRT monitor and you know we'd all pick like different characters that we wanted to kind of represent ourselves. It was just so cool to just sit there and, and try to figure this game out. Because there's no tutorial in this. You had to sit down and figure out the different ways to play this game. It was just so goddamn hard for, at, at least at that time, I think I was like 10, for us to like play through that, figure out what to do, what not to do, uh, figure out the different ways that you could fire your gun in the game, figure out the different strategies for moving your characters around. This is one of those games that just refuses to hold your hand. And there's a decent chance that if you do stick your hand out for help in this game, it's going to get chopped off. This is an incre It was an incredibly hard game, but I had so much fun playing it. It, it was just... Oh gosh, it was so cool. The first game in this series just, it brought me and a few of my friends together in a way that just a lot of other games didn't do. And yeah, I was so glad when David announced he was writing this book, and I'm just even more glad that I got a chance to read it. Anyway, getting back to the book, uh, we follow Julian Gallup's career as he does what a lot of people in the UK did during the 80s. Uh, he started making video games in his house, just on a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Uh, before that, he really got into making board games. And he goes through, well, David goes through his uh, history of creating different board games and just the way that that really influenced how Julian would make computer games later on. And Julian made a few different computer games, uh, sorry, a few different board games. And they were just very intricate. He talks about how at first he would like cannibalize the board games they had to kind of make the pieces for other games. And that reminded me a lot of when me and my friends would do similar things where the board game lays out a set of instructions, but you don't necessarily want to do that. You want to play your own game. Uh, the, I'm pretty sure a lot of kids probably did that. Uh, I think the big difference is Julian actually like wrote down his rules and everything, and he went like a, a many many steps further, and actually created new games on his own, not necessarily using the different pieces, but would actually come up, write down the rules and everything, and play test them with his friends, and it just seems like this really awesome way of doing things and. Yeah, it kind of brought me back to when I was a little kid when I was reading this, and just kind of making up your own game, and just creating different rules and everything. There was a lot of nostalgic feelings from me in this when I was reading this. Uh, I, I, I really, really loved this book. I know I'm going on a bunch of tangents, but I just found this book so much fun to read. But yeah, I, I just really like the way that David laid this whole thing out and how it just, you, you can see how uh, Julian's, like, his uh, style and the way he wanted to develop games came through from 
really working through a lot of those board games. It reminded me a lot of Sid Meier when he talked in his memoir about similar things that he did. It's just really cool to read about this stuff and to kind of see the slow evolution that, you know, the different games went through and how step by step each game sort of added a piece to what would become XCOM. It's just really cool to read that. I just was very fascinated with that as he, as Julian just kind of borrows one thing and then another thing and then another and then rolls them all together into the game that would eventually become XCOM. Then we get a bunch of stories for, <laughs> that I think are, are kind of like very universal in the games industry, but uh, definitely happened a lot in the UK video game industry, especially in the 80s, where you have one company that gets started up, and Julian makes a game or two with them, and then the financial backer just kind of takes all the profits and bails on the company, and, you know, they just kind of move on, like that company kind of falls apart because the financial backer's gone. Then Julian goes and kind of makes another company with a couple of his friends. They put out a game, then some conflicts between them kind of arise, and that company goes away, and then, you know, and then, and then this one was a little bit different because then Julian picks up, like, goes into business with his younger brother and then also with their dad and they create Mythos. Uh, and Mythos was, th they were the company behind XCOM. They then shopped the game around. It was going to be Laser Squad 2 and they shopped that around to a bunch of different publishers. Microprose UK eventually picked it up and that's kind of where like the real story at least for me starts because we start to hear more about the development of XCOM UFO Defense. And once XCOM got kind of greenlit there were a few growing pains that uh, Julian kind of had. He had never really written design documents for any of his games up to that point. He was still in like his early 20s. He really hadn't done a whole lot as far as like I guess what's sort of in the like more professional game development at this point. So he had never done a pitch meeting really, he never had design documents, and they had never really written a story or anything like that. There wasn't a whole lot of, well, why is this company doing things? They didn't really build a world for this game to kind of, or for his games to kind of exist in, they were just sort of... Here's something fun, it's got some themes in it, it's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, meat to it. That was pretty typical of video games in the 80s. You know, didn't necessarily need to know why things were happening. You just had like a very paper-thin story. And when you look at XCOM, yeah, it was the first few games are kind of like that. You just know... Aliens are coming to the planet, you have this secretive organization called XCOM, they fight the aliens, and then slowly the game kind of develops from there. David also talks about just how Microprose had an influence on the games. Uh, they brought in a lot of different things to sort of ratchet up the tension in the game. So you have some really amazing music here that just really makes you feel like there's danger whenever you get to the combat scenes. There's more of the action pack stuff when you're in the interceptor scene here, and then when you get on the ground, it really feels like there's a sense of just immediate danger everywhere that you go. And that's really because there was. Julian did such a great job with the AI, it just felt like you were constantly about to die when you were going through this mission and just oh man it, it was so crazy because you never knew what was going to happen you had to take these calculated risks and potentially lose your characters at just every single turn in the game there was also the lighting that went into play here and Julian did a great job of really making it feel like you know, the fog of war that you would see in strategy games was just omnipresent here. 
it's so much worse at night. You felt like, you know, at any point in time, you could just get shot at out of the darkness, and you'd never know really where it was coming from, what type of alien you were fighting, and it was, oh gosh, it was just so creepy playing this. They do talk a little bit about the difficulty spikes in this game, and oh man, are, are there some just ridiculous spikes in the difficulty. If you were doing too well early on, then you would get just this rapid increase of aliens. I remember going back and playing it in, oh gosh, probably about seven, eight years ago. And after the fourth mission, I'm already getting like large UFOs that I can't possibly fight off with what I have. And I'm running into like the muton aliens where my rifles just don't stand a chance against them or it's going to take so much longer to actually kill them off. And that was one of the just the staples of this game was how hard it actually was. But yeah, it was it was just so much fun to play and everything. I love reading about all these different stories, especially where I found out that the game got cancelled. And Microprose UK just didn't care. They were like, no, keep keep going with it. And then the quarterly reports were coming out, and the main office was like, we need a game, and Microprose was like, well, how about XCOM? It's almost finished now, and that's how the game got made. <laughs> it's stories like that that just make me really glad that people are taking the time to write books like this and you know just show a lot of the people who really love the games the different ways that they were all made it's just really cool to read about that stuff we then get into the next really two parts of, of the series and that's uh, XCOM Terror from the Deep and XCOM Apocalypse I like I knew very well that XCOM Terror from the Deep is just a reskin of the game of the first game. I didn't know how little, like a little um, how little <laughs> Julian was involved in the game, uh, really because he had turned his full attention to uh, Apocalypse at that point. And Terror from the Deep, it's fine. Uh, I didn't realize it came out like nine months after the first game, so. They turned that thing around really quick. It's just, like I said, it, it's just, uh, they just kind of reskinned it. Instead of fighting on land, for the most part, you're fighting underwater. Uh, you've got a lot more, like, dart guns and other types of technology and everything. So you're fighting a lot of underwater aliens. It's, it's fine for what it is. It's a pretty good follow-up it adds more to the story and everything and i think it's good in that way but it, you're not missing anything by not playing it it's still a fun game because it's basically ufo defense but this time you're you're underwater uh yeah it, it's okay uh, is the it's probably the nicest thing i can say it's okay it's definitely worth playing. I just don't have the same memories of it as the first one. Then they talk about Apocalypse. Um, to put it nicely, I think XCOM Apocalypse is a piece of shit. It's just... It, it was just... It, it was just awful. Um, I think even Julian in here says there are a lot of things he would like to change in it and it was kind of too ambitious. I definitely agree with that, it was too ambitious. Um, it, it just, I, I just really hated it. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of cool things in XCOM Apocalypse, and it felt like Julian had a ton of great ideas, just too many great ideas, and decided to throw all of those great ideas into a game, and it just, didn't quite work out very well. Uh, yeah, it, if he had toned it down a little bit, it, it would have been better. Uh, he did throw in some, like, real-time 
strategy, so normally XCOM is turn-based. This one allowed you to have real-time fights. I don't think that's really a good idea for XCOM, but, you know, whatever. I just really did not like Apocalypse at all. I'm glad that they talked about it in here because it is important to mention, but it's... I just hated it so much. David didn't really go into the the weird installments in the XCOM series. I think because he had to cut it off at some point, and I doubt that Julian had any input in those. And I don't think Mythos had any input in them. I'd have to go and check, but... That was like XCOM Enforcer, and I think Interceptor was one. I know there are like, t I think there are two. One of them is really weird, it takes place in space, and it's just kind of, kind of crap. Uh, Enforcer is kind of cool because it, it's kind of like a, a Doom clone, which is always interesting. It's not, I think that's about the most memorable thing I can say about it. Uh, those are those are like the weird XCOM games that don't really fit into the series. And he does talk a little bit about the reboots, like I mentioned. Uh, he kind of bookends the book like that. You know, they start out by talking about uh, like a uh, convention that Julian and then the person who worked on the remakes was at. And they were on a panel together. And then we kind of close out with the remakes as well as well as a game that Julian had kickstarted and was uh, came out and didn't quite do as well as they had expected, but still sounds pretty interesting, which, you know, fair enough. It's just, it wasn't as good as the Fire Axis version of uh, XCOM, but th those, those games were, those games are very, very good as well. So that's going to wrap things up for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed the review. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. And just have a great day, everybody. And also, have a happy Halloween.